Gas chromatography. Gas chromatography is simply a type of chromatography in which the mobile phase is a gas. We often call it the carrier gas. And the stationary phase can either be a solid or a non-volatile liquid that's coated on a solid. In this case, our analyte is either a gas or a volatile liquid that is boiling below 350 degrees Celsius. As shown in the figure here, we're going to inject the sample through a rubber septum using a needle or a syringe. And we have different parts of the instrument that are heated to control the vapor pressure of the analyte. The syringe injector is actually heated. We have an injector oven. We have a column oven. We have a detector oven. In all of these cases, we want to keep the temperature high enough that we keep our gas or our liquid in a volatile state, and we can make sure that it's going to be moving along through the system. GC columns can either be packed columns or they can be open tubular columns. The vast majority are open tubular. Sometimes if you're trying to separate small molecules like those in automobile exhaust, you might need a packed column where you're going to have fewer plates for your resolution, but you're going to be able to determine the unusual compounds. Your open tubular columns are capillary tubes. Usually they're glass that are coated with a thin layer of the non-volatile liquid stationary phase. Advantages of having a capillary column, an open tubular column, is that you need less sample, you get better resolution, you can analyze more peaks, and it's faster. Advantages of the packed column are that you'd be able to analyze small molecules that would otherwise simply rush through the coated open tubular column. With the types of columns, you can see here that the diameter is really quite small. We have somewhere in the range of 0.1 to 0.5 millimeters inner diameter. The stationary phase that is coating this is even thinner. Uh, 0.1 to 5 microns thick is pretty normal, and you want a thinner column, both in terms of diameter and stationary phase, in order to get better resolution. You can have also stationary phase particles that coat the inside of the column here, you can see that on the side with the support coated and porous layer open tubular columns. Here's a description of what your typical column lengths are, and you'll notice that the packed columns are significantly less long and they're wider, um, have larger diameters. You'll notice that the GC columns have considerable lengths. We have between 10 and 100 meters for most of our open tubular columns, but our packed column is between 1 and 6 meters long. You can get a considerably larger amount of sample onto the wall-coated and packed columns than you can onto a simple open tubular column. Because of the packing, we have a pretty high pressure and slow speed for the packed columns. Usually it's resolution that matters, so when we have a thinner column in terms of our inner diameter, we will get a better resolution but also less sample holding capacity. As you can see in this plot, the chromatogram on the right is for the smaller diameter column. Also, if you increase the length of the column, you're increasing the number of theoretical plates, and you're going to get better res resolution due to that. The more thick your stationary phase is on your wall-coated open tubular column, the better your resolution will be. However, you're going to get more bleed of the liquid stationary phase and higher background levels. Columns for GC are typically made of glass, and then have some sort of functionalization of the glass surface. We do have a problem that you can actually get physical absorption of polar and polarizable species on the silica surface because of the OH groups on the silica. When that happens, you're going to get distorted or broad peaks, and it's due to those silanol groups. So instead, what we do is we deactivate the surface by silanizing it with dimethyl chloroacylene, as shown in the center. Using that, we now have chloride functional groups which we can wash away with methanol and replace the chlorine groups with methoxy groups. Stationary phases have certain desirable qualities. In GC, particularly, we don't want the stationary phase to be volatile. We want the stationary phase to stay on the column as we heat it up. So it should be thermally stable. It should be chemically inert. We should have certain characteristics so that we have good retention time and relative retention times for our solutes in order to get a reasonable separation. Also, the species that we're interested in have to have some kind of solubility with our stationary phase. And if we have a good match, then the order of evolution is determined by the boiling points of the eluents. The general rule is to remember that like dissolves like. As shown in the picture here, we have different stationary phases where we've done chemistry to that silane group. And you'll see that the top one, which is our most common, is the diphenyl dimethyl polysiloxane. So we have phenyl groups and methyl groups 
which, depending on the ratio between these, allows us to have a nonpolar or intermediate polarity group. When you don't have a particularly polar stationary phase, then all of your retention time will be based on boiling point. Here you see a table of our typical types of compounds in terms of groups, organized according to whether they are nonpolar or polar or somewhere in between. You can use this with the previous slide to determine what type of column would be appropriate for your GC. This is a general application of what you're normally going to use for some of your common applications, going from the purely nonpolar polydimethyl siloxane column all the way up to our 50% cyanopropyl polydimethyl siloxane, which is used for very polar compounds. What's important to realize about this is that each of these columns has a maximum temperature. Above that temperature, you're going to see significant degradation of the column, and we call this column bleed. The separation in GC depends definitely on volatility. Your high boiling point compounds are going to be less volatile and will be slower to move through the system and will elute later. However, if your stationary phase is polar, then the elution also depends on polarity. In this example here, we have a lot of linear alkanes, and then we also have a few ketones and alcohols. In the case of the nonpolar stationary phase on the left, elution is based on boiling point alone. On the right-hand side with the polar stationary phase, the four alkanes will elute first because they have low relative interaction with the stationary phase. Then the ketones, which have intermediate polarity, and finally the alcohols. Hydrogen bonding to the alcohols will make them elute last. In GC, we can use temperature programming or pressure programming to adjust our retention times. Temperature programming is where we raise the temperature of the column during chromatography. Pressure programming is where we increase the flow rate and decrease retention time as a result. We would do this in order to adjust the retention time to sharpen peaks and to make late eluding peaks come out quicker. With temperature programming, we want to make sure that we don't exceed the maximum temperature for the column, which can be found in the box. The columns will degrade above a certain temperature. You want to look at the box and see what the temperature is for minimum bleed. Sometimes though, our analyte itself will decay or degrade due to temperature. In that case, you might want to use pressure programming to avoid that thermal degradation. Another advantage of pressure programming is that you don't have to wait for the column to cool back down afterwards. This is a set of temperature programming for a complex mixture of different hydrocarbons. As you can see on the plots, they're labeled with a number of carbons in their backbone. On the top, we have isothermal conditions where everything is held at 150 Celsius. On the bottom, we have a programmed temperature profile where we're going from 50 to 250 degrees at eight degrees per minute. As you can see, you get much better regular separation of the peaks with temperature programming. And more importantly, at the top, we have C15 compounds eluding at an hour and a half, whereas at the bottom, we have C15 compounds eluding at perhaps 19 minutes. This does not change the order of elution, but it does control how quickly things elute and also control the resolution. We have a choice in GC of what the carrier gas would be. It's typically helium, nitrogen, or argon, and sometimes it's hydrogen. What's important is that the carrier gas must be chemically inert. We don't want it reacting with our sample. The gas that you choose often is dictated by what type of detector you're going to use. And sometimes the system will contain a molecular sieve to dry the gas or to remove oxygen from it. A typical flow rate is between 25 and 250 mils per minute with packed columns, and between 1 to 25 mils per minute with capillary columns. When choosing carrier gases for gas chromatography, you have to think about what your trade-offs are between convenience, cost, and plate height. You'll recall from the basics of chromatography that a small plate height is desirable for the best resolution. As you see in the picture on the top right, we have different maximum velocities for good plate heights. In particular, nitrogen is going to require that you have the slowest separation for good resolution, then helium, and then hydrogen. So we say that hydrogen is the fastest. The reason for this is that we have greater diffusion of solutes in hydrogen and in helium than in nitrogen, and that's going to affect how quickly things diffuse. Other notes to consider are the compatibility with certain detectors. Helium is the most common carrier gas and is compatible with most detectors. Nitrogen, however, is going to give you a better detection limit than helium will with a flame ionization detector, or FID. Hydrogen has some negative aspects to it, particularly that it can be explosive at certain concentrations, including that it can make it more difficult to get a good vacuum pressure for GCMS, and that it will react with unsaturated organic molecules. In terms of cost, helium is simply expensive. Nitrogen is cheap, we have so much of it in our air, 
and hydrogen is in, in between. We can split it from water. Looking at the same analytes on the same column with three different carrier gases, you'll notice different resolution and time with the three, where hydrogen on the far right is the fastest with the best resolution, helium is intermediate, and nitrogen is the slowest with the worst resolution. To inject a sample into GC, we do have to use a syringe going through a rubber septum into an injection port. We'll typically inject somewhere between 0.1 and 2 microliters of liquid samples. Gases are handled a little bit differently. You have to change out the rubber septa every so often due to perforation from the injection. The injection port itself is often heated to volatilize the liquid as soon as you inject it. And the goal is to get a narrow plug of sample on the column all at once. Sometimes that means we have to be pretty crafty about how we suck up the sample, and it's recommended to make an air sandwich so that the analyte doesn't start to diffuse from the syringe tip as you stick the needle in. As shown here, we have a sandwich of air, then solvent, then air, then sample, then air, going from the plunger all the way to the needle tip. We have three different types of injection ports for GC. As shown here, from left to right, we have split injection, splitless injection, and on-column injection. On-column injection is probably the easiest to describe because you're simply putting your syringe straight onto the column itself. It's really best for things that are unstable in terms of thermal degradation, things that have really high boiling solvents, and if you really want quantitative analysis. Split injection all the way to the left is pretty routine for introducing small sample volumes into an open tubular column. You have a purge gas, which is going sideways in split injection, and only some of your analyte is making it onto the column. We have a split ratio in this case, which is how much carrier gas is going to the split vent versus how much is going onto the column. You'll notice that there are different labels in milliliters per minute here. So with our split injection, we have a total of 102 mils per minute, one of which is going to septum purge, which is sweeping away any kind of gases that might just be leaking in through the septum from the air. We have one mil per minute going onto the column for analysis, and you have 100 mils per minute going out the split vent. This would be a 100 to 1 split ratio. Splitless injection uses a very similar setup to split injection, but we actually have no side sweeping gas. We have two mils per minute. One mil is going to sweeping the actual injection port and one mil is going to our column. Then on column injection is literally all gas all the time straight onto the column. We normally will use split injection if our sample is fairly concentrated and concentrated in GC can mean different things. It means if it makes up more than 0.1% of the column. In that case, injecting a whole microliter is going to put too much material on the column, and so we want some of the injected material to go to waste. Unfortunately, the split ratio is not very reproducible, and sometimes this can be bad for quantitative analysis. Detection. We need some way to see the analytes as they elute off the column in gas chromatography. We have a lot of ways to do this, a lot of different physical properties that we can take advantage of. That includes spectrophotometry, luminescence, thermal properties, infrared, mass spectrometry. In all of the cases, we want to integrate the peak areas to do quantitation, and we need to use the method of internal standards for quantitation. The method of internal standards is where you have a different standard from your compound that you add into all samples at known concentration, and then you can calculate a response factor by ratioing the peak areas to the known peak concentrations. An ideal detector for GC is going to be sensitive, that depends on your application, stable, reproducible, have a linear response, be able to work over a wide temperature range, at least up to 400 Celsius, because that's our range of volatile samples. We want it to be a quick response time. We want the response time to have nothing to do with the flow rate. We want it to be easy to use, reliable. We want it to be similar in response to all solutes, and we want it to be non-destructive. Along these lines, we have some of these most common options. A flame ionization detection for hydrocarbons, thermal conductivity, which is really a universal detector, electron capture for halogenated compounds, mass spectrometry, which is tunable for any species, thermionic detection, which is good for nitrogen and phosphorus, photoionization, which is good for compounds ionized by UV radiation, and FTIR, which is good for organic compounds. What you'll notice along the right-hand side of this is the variety of detection limits for each of these, with electron capture being extremely sensitive, but really only sensitive to halogenated compounds. In general, you'll see that a lot of different techniques will be used based on what the actual analytical method is. A pretty generalized detector is going to be the thermal conductivity or the mass spectrometer. Another aspect to consider is what the linear range is for each of the detectors. 
in large linear range as desirable. Thermal conductivity detectors, or TCDs, are simple and universal. They respond to all analytes. In the case of this, we have a hot tungsten filament in the detector. As the carrier gas flows over it, the carrier gas itself has a high thermal conductivity. Usually we're using hydrogen or helium. When the analyte elutes, though, it has a lower thermal conductivity than the carrier gas. Because of this lower thermal conductivity, we're going to have a filament that gets hotter, and as it gets hotter, the electrical resistance goes up. Because of this going up, the voltage across the filament changes, and that voltage equals our detection. This kind of detector is more sensitive at low flow rates and is really good for packed columns because of this. The flame ionization detector, or FID, is possibly the most commonly used detector for GC. In this kind of detector, we have the eluate actually being burned in a mixture of hydrogen and air. This doesn't mean that you have to use hydrogen as your mobile phase. Usually the hydrogen is a separate source. When you're burning this, one out of every 10 to the 5 carbon atoms produces an ion during burning. The current from those ions is then measured. Unfortunately, the FID is not sensitive to non-hydrocarbons. When you're using an FID, nitrogen as your carrier gas gives your best detection limit. You can use nitrogen as a makeup gas if you happen to be using helium as your mobile phase. We have a really good linear response range, and we get much better detection than thermal conductivity. Electron capture detector is sensitive to halogen-containing molecules because these are electronegative. In this case, the carrier gas is nitrogen, or possibly 5% methane and argon. Inside the detector, we have a radioactive nickel foil, which releases high-energy electrons. These electrons from the radioactive source will then ionize the gas that's eluding off the column. If the analytes have high electron affinity, they'll capture some of these electrons and decrease the conductivity of the plasma. Therefore, because your analyte has captured the electrons, we call it an electron capture detector. Because of the need to capture the electrons, you have to have some kind of electronegative species, such as halogens, conjugated carbonyls, nitriles, nitro compounds, and organometallic compounds. This image compares the kinds of information that you would acquire using the flame ionization detector on top or using a more specific detector on bottom. The FID will respond to the hydrocarbons in natural gas, and you'll see a lot of large peaks due to those hydrocarbons. This is illustrated on top. Sulfur coming luminescence detector, however, will show organosulfur compounds that are just too dilute to see with the flame ionization detector. This kind of detector is completely insensitive to hydrocarbons, and so you'll see a completely different set of peaks for only those compounds which contain sulfur. Sulfur compounds are, of course, normal in natural gas because of the particular additives that are added to make the natural gas smell bad. That way we know when we're about to explode. Lastly, mass spectrometry can be a very helpful detector for GC. It's universal, it's sensitive. In this case, we do have to ionize the analytes as they loot off the GC column, and they're usually ionized by electron ionization. Then the ions are separated by mass using either electric or magnetic fields in quadrupole or magnetic sector mass analyzers, or they are accelerated and separated in space using time of flight mass spectrometry. Chromatograms for mass spectrometry are made that are specific to the elements, molecules, or molecular fragments because you can plot a different intensity of a peak in a mass spectrum over the time of the chromatogram. The general setup of your GCMS is to have the injection port, the GC column, which is usually wound and is very long, and then you'll have the ion source, the analyzer, an electron multiplier, and a data system. The interface between the GC column and the mass spec usually involves some kind of spray and then a skimmer. You can qualitatively identify peaks using GCMS by selected ion monitoring. In this case, what we have is the total ion chromatogram on the top, which is showing all of the different intensities of all of the peaks in the mass spectrum over the time of chromatographic elution. If you then select one ion, for example here, mass to charge ratio 78, then what you're able to do is look at only those fragments that have a mass to charge ratio of 78. In this case, it is the benzene ring plus one that's only present when you have those compounds. To do quantitative analysis, we will need to use the internal standards, as mentioned before. Aside from electron impact, it's possible to use inductively coupled plasma to ionize and fragment molecules so that we could do GC, ICP, MS. In that case, the GC is used to separate pesticides in this example. The ICP is used to ionize and fragment the molecules, and the mass spectrometry is used to identify the molecules.